Um, first of all, I would like to uh, welcome you all to our book dissemination on the Productions Network in Southeast Asia. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Um, actually, this seminar is a collaboration between economic faculty of the Thomas Hack University and uh, economic research institutes for Asians and East Asians or e -reader. So I think it's a time to the opening sessions. Um, then I would like to invite the deans of economic faculty Thomas Hack University Associate Professor Cheyan Pati Pusadakan to uh, provide some opening remarks to us. Uh, on behalf of the faculty, I would like to welcome Professor Kimura, uh, Chief Economist of Urea, Urea researchers, colleagues, and distinct requests uh, to the Faculty of Economics at the University. It is our great uh, pleasure to have a formal academic co collaboration uh, between the Faculty of Economics and Urea, one of the leading international organizations in Asia. Uh, the seminar today is based on the book entitled Production Networks in Southeast Asia. You will see uh, the book soon, which is a collection of research papers by economists worldwide, uh, including one of our faculty uh, members, Dr. Ashna, who is coming soon. <laughs> this is a king somewhere. Now, said Bangkok always a uh, uh, busy place. And Traffic jam always cause a problem. Uh, the, the issue of the production network has been one of the thought for uh, working topics for policy makers over the past decade. Uh, since uh, the production network become one of the economic globalization facets, uh, it continued to play an important role in, in uh, economic dyna dynamic research in the Asia region, especially for East Asia. Southeast Asia, including Thailand. Uh, key interesting question regarding this issue involves how indigenous firms move up the network's uh, value chain and receive higher value added, and what role the government uh, should and could play in this regard. Uh, these issues are addressed in this book. Uh, this book is also timely launched as the world economy is under threat of nationalism sentiment around the world. Uh, better understanding in this uh, topic might help policy makers around the world to realize the fruit from economic cooperation instead of focusing on single country interests. Uh, today, two out of 13 chapters are presented here. One is presented by Dr. Im from Iria and the other by our faculty, Dr. Chanan. I hope that all participants would benefit more or less from the seminar today. I'm sure that uh, the cooperation like today uh, would be a good starting point for further cooperation between the two organizations in many more areas. Uh, our faculty members are very active in many fields, uh, including environment, uh, inequality, labor, and macro. Uh, all which are potential areas for our further cooperation. Uh, without further delay, I would like to end my opening remark here and invite all of us to hear the remark from Iria for our uh, cooperation. So please, Professor Kimura. Um, uh, uh, members and also uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for coming and it's, it's a great, uh, great honor to have this kind of uh, occasions and really appreciate uh, some faculty at the University of South University. Uh, area is a uh, uh, research institute, actually an uh, international organization established in uh, 2008. Uh, we, uh, we got uh, seed money from Japan, and actually collecting some other money from uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, India, and also ASEAN. And we have ASEAN plus six setting uh, to uh, do uh, various kinds of policy research uh, for promoting equity uh, integration in ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, actually, I've been uh, chief economist uh, from the beginning. Uh, 
and uh, leading uh, the contents of uh, research activities. Uh, we have three big pillars in our research. Uh, one is a uh, deepening equity integration, uh, like uh, following up uh, AEC, ASEAN equity integration, and also East Asian equity integration, uh, doing uh, various kinds of micro data study on uh, the impact of globalization on uh, corporate activities and others. So the second pillar is a narrow development gaps, uh, uh, how to promote the small and medium enterprises, and also how to uh, enhance uh, innovation. And uh, this is we are doing the digital economy, industry 4.0, uh, uh, or services in global uh, global value chains, and those are some of the topics that we are working on. Uh, the third is uh, sustain sustainable development, as in some environmental issues. And also, uh, we have a big, uh, big chunk of uh, research on energy issues. Uh, those are the, the areas that we are working on. We are not really doing much on macro monetary issues, but uh, the micro uh, aspects of various uh, phases of uh, economic development. That's our topic. Uh, we are running about uh, 40 research projects a year. Uh, we, we are still pretty small, only 15 economists. So that means that they are pretty busy, but uh, trying to keep some academic quality uh, as far as we can do. Uh, so hopefully that we will get more participation in our research activities uh, from the uh, faculty members and uh, researchers. Uh, for this uh, project, uh, the title is uh, Production Networks in Southeast Asia. Uh, this is a survey of uh, so the, the current status of the production networks in, uh, in this region. Uh, so some, some people say that, that after, since, since 2013, we had some sort of a slowdown in the world trade. And uh, some people say that uh, production networks, local the very chains may not be very important from now. But uh, we really do not share that uh, understanding. Actually, the mechanism of uh, doing this kind of international production uh, networks uh, would be very, very important and it's, it's, it's continuously important, uh, particularly for this region. ASEAN and the uh, surrounding East Asia are uh, sort of forerunners of utilizing uh, this kind of mechanism uh, in order to promote uh, speed up economic development. Thailand is uh, one of the forerunners, as you know, particularly in manufacturing activities uh, connected to thick international production networks at the same time forming industrial agglomeration and then actually a bank of metropolitan area is a pretty efficient industrial agglomeration to utilize international production networks. So uh, still uh, some of the countries in ASEAN, uh, say starting from uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, are uh, in the process of coming into production networks. And also uh, in Indonesia, the Philippines, and uh, Vietnam, uh, still in the process of forming uh, industrial agglomeration. So many countries in ASEAN can learn a lot from uh, Tha Thailand's experience too. And then beyond that, uh, certainly uh, in the past 10 years, uh, the growth rate of uh, Thailand is uh, a bit slowed down, uh, maybe due to a political situation, but maybe due to some sort of difficulty in uh, moving up from uh, up upper middle income to uh, fully developed economies. Uh, so, uh, so certainly what we can do uh, for manufacturing activities and how to get the technology transfer, technology spillover to upgrade innovation, uh, that would be one of the challenges uh, that, that Thailand is facing, maybe Malaysia too. Uh, so, uh, and also the services sector is going to be more, more and more important, but the, the really service sector can lead uh, economic development from now on and not. This is a sort of a question that we really have to answer. So, so I think uh, we still, the importance of the international production networks, this is uh, very, very uh, still there uh, in, in our country. Uh, but uh, uh, then, then some latecomers can learn from uh, foreign us. And at the same time, uh, beyond this, uh, how to step up there. That to the fully developed economies, and this is a sort of big challenge. And so, so today, uh, so it's, a, it's great to have uh, two presentations. Uh, one is by uh, Dr. Mini, uh, one of our uh, uh, senior economists uh, in uh, area. Uh, probably she will go over uh, what's going on in each country, each country, and also. Uh, we are utilizing uh, uh, various kinds of data sets or information. 
uh, including, say, trade and value added, and also uh, various kinds of trade statistics for the resources. Uh, then Achanan, Dr. Achanan will uh, uh, talk about probably industrial uh, promoting policies and probably uh, talking more on uh, a sort of the last step to move up uh, how to uh, go from uh, upper middle income to high income. So uh, hopefully that uh, the seminar will be useful uh, for you uh, to think of uh, what's, what's going on in this region. So, so this is a book. And uh, I, I'm very sorry, but this is very expressive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, today, a 30% discount. So oh. if you really like to have it, this is a big chance. <laughs> so, so, but I have one compliment I call you for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Professor Kimura and Professor James for interesting remarks. And now I think it's time to your first session. Um, I'd like to interview the today's moderator, that is uh, Assistant Professor Duhati Domoni. Please welcome her. <laughs> Actually, uh, Professor Duhati, she's currently a lecturer in the Faculty of Economics here, and she's expert in macroeconomics especially monetary economics, international trade, um, international finance, and so on. And now, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ajahn Monisa, for introducing me. And uh, uh, thank you, Dean and Professor Kimula, also uh, to, uh, for the providing a nice opening remarks. So today, I think uh, Professor Kimula already thought that today we will talk about the uh, uh, books, right? The chapter in the books about the uh, production uh, network in Southeast Asia. And today we have the uh, two speakers. One is uh, Dr. Lily Ng from the area, right? She holds a PhD from the Australian National University, and now currently she uh, like uh, uh, works as a senior economist at the area. And the second one is uh, Dr. Ashnan Gopaygun. He is uh, our faculty member and. Uh, she also, he also holds a PhD from the Australian National University and now he is an associate professor in our faculty. And then Dr. Lily today, she will talk the overall like, for the books and then she will touch up on uh, the one question that's quite important is how the country that belong to the network move up the value chain. Right? And then Dr. Ashinan will talk more on the policy side by drawing the lesson from the Southeast Asian country, including Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines. And then he will tell that uh, how the policy should be, right, be in the production network and how to move up the value chain. So I would like to introduce Dr. Lily to like, uh, talk about the first part. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us today. It's really such a great honor for us to be here having discussions with great scholars from Thailand. Thank you. Uh, in this session, let's discuss production networks in Southeast Asia. The economic growth of East Asia has outperformed the world economic growth for the past two decades. The emerging Southeast Asian economies, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, had an average growth of 5.2% from 2005 to 2015. And as you can see here, this figure shows the share of the manufacturing value added to the world value added. The left hand side is countries which have decreasing trend of the share of manufacturing value added to the world value added. And the right hand side is countries which have increasing trends in terms of the share of manufacturing value added to the world value added. And we can find here five 
out of the seven gainers in terms of the share of manufacturing value added to world value added are ASEAN countries. China, Korea, India, Indonesia, and Thailand. So those five countries have a tendency of increasing trends in terms of the total share, uh, in terms of the share of manufacturing, the value added. So what this graph share shows is that there has been a shift of drivers of economic growth when it comes to value added in manufacturing. There is a shift from the West to East Asia countries because the, the trend will be increasing, hopefully, the increase will be sustained, quote on quote, is Asia perceived as political macro, as well as what so-called industrial policy, which later on will be discussed by our channel. But industrial policy that we would like to highlight here, we should perceive as a more general policy. The, the increasing trend of the share of manufacturing value added to total world value added is largely because East Asia's economies has achieved such high economic growth as well as increasing trend in terms of manufacturing value added because East Asia has applying has been applying development strategies that have aggressively exploited the mechanics of global value chains. Based on trade in value added, Asia accounts for more than 50% of the world's automobile productions, 62% of liquid display grid, 86% of smartphones, and 100% of digital cameras. So we can see how much East Asia and Asia has connected to one another and then leveling up its value added in the manufacturing sectors, particularly related to machinery and automobiles and electronics and their components. Now we're gonna see case study country by country for the six main Southeast Asian countries. Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, Singapore, and Vietnam. The main question is that, what does increasing value added mean? And how can a country increase its value added? When we are talking about East Asia, we cannot run from China. It's always the case that China is the hub of manufacturing industry in these regions. So the main question recently is that what are the impacts of the growing Chinese economy? What will be the impacts of Chinese trade to ASEAN trade? This study is conducted by Professor Yu and, Miao, uh, and Xiaomi. And what they find is that in, the trend of, in terms of total exports, so if we analyze using the total exports, we can see that Chinese exports to ASEAN will tend to promote ASEAN's exports, while China's exports to the world will crowd out ASEAN's trade. So it's gonna squeeze the competition, it's, uh, it's gonna increase the competition, and it's gonna squeeze ASEAN's trade. That's if we see based on the total exports. But if we look into deeper, based on the value added, the story is going in the opposite directions. So China's exports to the world actually will increase ASEAN's exports. Largely because China imports many of resource materials from ASEAN countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, and uh, Thailand, uh, such as fuels, minerals, plastics and rubbers, uh, plastics as well as rubbers 
and the material inputs uh, for machinery products. Now, in the case of Indonesia, this study is conducted by Triputra and me. We use firm level, this is the first study that combine firm and product level data. Indonesia has manufacturing survey, uh, which you covers large and medium enterprises. Uh, we run it every year, so it covers around 3,000 firms every year. This study covers from 2000 to 2011, and then what we find is that a reduction of 1% of input tariff will increase Indonesia's firm productivity by 0.02%. The reasons of the increased productivity is because of firms opening up trade policy, firms can get access to cheaper input or to better quality input, or both. That kind of getting more access to input increase productivity by the fact that now firm can improve its product quality as well as product variety. In the sense of exporting firms, exporting firms tend to have higher productivity than average firms because it has increased variety and quality of the products. But the foreign-owned firms have a tendency of higher productivity, but they do not necessarily have increased variety and quality of the products. The reason is that exporting firms, they tend to expand their export markets, right? So they try to invent new products. They try to find new markets. But foreign firms who are based in Indonesia, they have the market already in Indonesia. So that's one of the reasons that they both have increased productivity because now they can get access to lower price inputs and better quality inputs. But foreign or own firms based in Indonesia might not necessarily need for them to invent <coughs> new products because now they have a market already in Indonesia. So in the case of Malaysia, they are using input-output data for Malaysia. It claims that the larger proportions of foreign inputs are found in non-resource manufacturing industries, such as basic metals, machinery, electrical, and optical equipment, as compared to resource-based sectors such as food and wood and paper products. And it's quite interesting in the sense like there are two shifts in electronic exports in Malaysia. The first one is there is a shift towards finished goods. So there, there was extensive margins in Malaysia, but not necessarily in terms of value of exports of electronic products. And also there is a shift from manufacturing services to semiconductor manufacturing services. And then they also analyzed based on the revealed comparative advantage. Um, they claims that the highest revealed comparative advantage in Malaysia are auto electronics. And then followed by electronic data processing and components and devices and semiconductor parts. Now in the case of Philippines, the Philippines is shows that the level of participation of the Philippines in the electronic global value chains have increased substantially from 1995 to 2009. But based on the revealed comparative advantage analysis, the Philippines remain strong in semiconductors, but it's still lagging behind ASEAN countries. So even though in the Philippines getting picking up in semiconductors, but Philippines is still lagging behind Malaysia and Singapore in Southeast Asia when it comes to semiconductor industry. Now, uh, when discussed about Singapore, there's 
nothing much industrial developments in Singapore. But as we can see, Singapore, I should say like Singapore is quite strategic. In the sense like Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew have seen Singapore to become a regional hub, to become a trading country. So what Singapore has been doing is that it's sifting up its proportions or the, the, the value added of in the manufacturing sectors is mainly contributed by its services such as logistics and financial sectors. And it shows that more than 30% of the value added contained in its manufactured products are actually coming from its services to manufacturing. So that's one of the reasons that Singapore now is trying to get more engagements with ASEAN countries in the services sector, such as aviation, uh, logistic, finance, telecommunications. Now, in the case of Thailand, I cannot tell, tell much on Thailand. I think like this is the time for me to learn from you. Uh, this study is conducted by Patarapong, who is professor at Griggs University. He is Thai economist based in Tokyo. So if you find any mistakes, we can put the blame on him <laughs> because he's not here. Uh, anyway, he did such amazing job to analysis for Thailand and we focus on the Thai auto industries here. Because everybody knows here, Thailand is the hub of auto industry in Southeast Asia. Thailand has been the largest producer as well as exporters when it comes to auto compared to other Southeast Asian countries. It has been positioned itself as the largest producers since back then 1990s. And now uh, Thai can produce up to 1.8 million unit cars. Um, the second one of the largest auto producers is Indonesia. I'm from Indonesia, but we are not competitors. So Thailand and Indonesia are not competitors. Thailand now is really focusing on the one-ton pickup trucks as well as sedan, while Indonesia is mainly producing the nine-seat passenger cars. So we are actually complementary. And then in terms, and, and we can see here, even though Thailand is the largest auto producer in Indonesia, when it comes to, we use the analysis of intra-industry trade. So what, how much the intensity of trading between Thailand and its main trading partners in auto industry. And we find is that Thailand basically imports compressors from Indonesia, imports diesel filter from Cambodia, imports airbags from the Philippines. That's kind of production networks that Thailand has been developed uh, in, in Thai based industry. So what the main message of this chapter is that Thailand local content requirement policy, so back to the early 1970s, 80s, Thailand adopted local content requirements, which means that the car has to have certain level of content, content uh, local content requirements. So those components should be produced in Thailand. But it says that it didn't work at that time. Thailand failed to develop uh, auto industry at that time. But now, what Thailand did is actually very smart. Lately, Thailand developed openness and more technology upgrading policy. If I'm not mistaken, Thailand has the research centers and collaborations with university. Thailand also upgrading its workers by sending out for trainings. Thailand also have a really uh, good centers for workers for auto industries. But correct me if I'm wrong, this is just something that I learned from the books. So I really need your advice uh, on this and I would very much look forward to also having discussions with other industries uh, that you think might be important for us to highlight in the production networks. Next, uh, when it comes to Vietnam, Vietnam is, is a very unique country. It's 
growing extensively when it comes to trade. It used to be a very close country, uh, but since uh, early 2000, say 2005, I think like the growth of uh, Thai exports has been growing uh, massively lately. If we see here, based on the trade in value added, actually the ratio of domestic value added to total exports of Thailand decreased from 76, uh, 76 sorry, 79% in 1995 to 64% in 2009. As we can see here, the black line shows the ratio of domestic value added to total exports. And the column graph shows uh, exports and imports of Thailand, uh, of Vietnam. But as we can see here, the decrease in terms of the share of domestic value added to total exports is accompanied by increase in total exports of Vietnam with an average annual growth of 20% from 2002 to 2017. Vietnam is, is really one of the highlights that showing that the mindset of Thailand, Thailand and Vietnam are really kind of a, a very appealing cases in Southeast Asia where the mindset of having increased domestic value added is not necessarily be the best answer. In fact, like by using foreign inputs or whichever, I'm not really saying that we have to import or we, or we have to import all the imported goods. What I'm saying is that we should use or choose inputs produced at the optimal level of cost of production, at the at the best one, when when we can get the best price at the best quality. So Thailand and Vietnam are quite interesting in the sense like it shows that even though the ratio of domestic value added to total exports decrease, but the value of exports is increasing. And Learning from East Asia, comparing with other regions, based on trade in value added, it shows that the intensity of regional production networks in ASEAN is relatively higher than that of Latin American countries, but it is still lower than that of Central Eastern Europe. One of the reasons is that ASEAN Compared to Central Eastern Europe, Central Eastern Europe has an anchor economy. It has German, which is the source of final demand for trade, source of investments, as well as technology. So it's self-contained. But in the case of ASEAN, ASEAN can be a regional hub. But the fact that ASEAN cannot be self-content, the fact that ASEAN still relies, the final demand still coming from the US and Europe, and to some extent to Japan and Korea, investment largely coming from Japan and the US, and source of technology largely coming from Japan and South Korea. So in that kind of sense, what we suggested is that ASEAN might or, or sh should consider to get into be more integrated with East ASEAN countries, particularly Japan, Korea, and to some extent now China, as China is growing in terms of source of investments, a little bit of technology, and of course uh, in terms of final demand. So to be able to make more intensity in terms of production networks, the kind of regions should equip themselves with demand for final goods, technology, as well as investments. So the key message of what we are doing is that first, 
Trade is growing. And production is cut slices. Task is fragmented. We fully understand that there has been increasing anti-sentiment of globalizations these days. Not only not only in Europe, not only in the U.S., but it's getting uh, also like the sentiment is is growing everywhere. One of the key message is that. Now we can see that specializations. Are, are there any of you? Uh, probably I can see many students here. I, I presume that you have taken international economics, right? How many of students? Like you're you're taking international economics already, right? <laughs> so, looking back into the basic international economics theory, we learn at we learn the the absolute advantage, right? And we learn comparative advantage, right? But it's no longer country comparative advantage. Nowadays, specialization is really firm specific, product specific, and worker specific. Nowadays, with the technology, you can be your own producer. You can sell your own product. Just getting access, you can sell your products throughout the world. So that's kind of growing technology and the mobility. Now, I don't know how many of you travel to Europe, travel to US, or at least I believe many of you travel to Bali. With this kind of increased technology, increased mobility, increase uh, in terms of mobility of labor and technology and data, Nowadays, we're no longer talking about country comparative advantage. It's really firm specific advantages. It's really product specific advantages. It's really you specific advantages. Now, Archanos is working with AREA and international organizations, and his publications can be worldwide, right? So, this is kind of making policies should be designed such that not to protecting jobs. I think everybody is not a big fan of Trump, I know, but I just want to emphasize that protecting job is not the answer. If you're trying to produce everything by yourself, see, see in ourselves how many products that we can produce. Shall we plant rice? Shall we teach? Shall we deliver letters? Shall we cook? Shall we drive our car, so we do everything by ourselves, right? Right? Mm -hmm. So it's really product, it's really your specializations. What would be the best thing that you can do to achieve the optimal level of productivity, right? In order for you to be able to achieve the optimal wages. Because by, by, by producing output at your optimal productivity, that you can achieve your optimal wages, your optimal return. It's either you are as a worker or you are as investors. So this is key message is that we design policies such that to increase value added of workers, making the workers become more mobile. So giving good health, education, training, and skills, making each workers or domestic workers become more mobile so they can move across industries. My parents used to work only one job for the like he is running business and he's doing it for the rest of his life. Nowadays look at your 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 surroundings. I believe one of you might change seven times jobs or probably three times jobs in a year, which is very common. Because what? Because now you're getting more mobile, right? You're getting yourself more, more mobile. You can do analysis for, for macroeconomics. You can change to econometrics. You can do change to Bank of Thailand. The next day, you're going to change yourself, become entrepreneurs. So this is kind of policy that we advocate to government. Making workers become more, getting more skilled, more educated, and more mobile. And then the second one is another important thing. The increasing global, uh, increasing anti-globalizations, really making us to think we should protect 
domestic producers. We should protect. Think about value added. Think about this is the clothes. And then how much that the inputs cost of these clothes. The producer has to pay for the, the clothes, <coughs> button, thread, and all the accessories and designs. So for example, we come up with 10,000, uh, 1,000. And then we sell the product 1,000 and 100. So the value added is 100, okay? The value added that we are doing because, because we design the product, for example. Then if we are thinking to produce everything, we produce the button, we produce the clothes, we design, we marketing everything by ourselves, we are thinking that our producer, domestic producers can do everything, and even we try to produce what we used to import, right? This might increase domestic value added relative to exports. But the main question is coming back to, is it really the optimal level that you want to achieve? What we find is that it's probably, again, I have to highlight, it might not be the best. I'm not talking about the best options or the second options policy. But what I want to highlight is that it would be okay to have a decreasing ratio of domestic value added to total exports, but at the same time, we expect that the total exports should increase, okay? So it's actually just about uh, numerator and denumerator. So probably like the, tot the, the share would be decreasing, but if the decrease is coming from increase in exports, that's fine. German, has been always importing 72% higher than French for the last three decades. But Germans always export around double than that of France. So that's something that if I can bring it into the case of developing countries, and this one is the case of developing uh, developed countries. So this kind of mindset that we would like to share. Again, I'm not, I'm not, or we are not advocating that imports are the best, you know. What we are advocating is that we, as economists, government officials, scholars, we have to think to get access for the producers, to get access, that can good get access to the inputs that produce at the lowest cost and the best quality ever. So by having getting more access, by having more openness in terms of trade and investments, we give more access for our domestic producers. We facilitate them to grow. And again, we don't need to pick one of the winners. Most of the time, government is always good picking the loser, right? <laughs> And then most of the times, the losers is always good picking the good government. They are very good lobbyists. So in that sense, uh, we're trying to shift from not picking the winner's policy by having giving more access to everyone, to all industries, small, medium enterprises, all workers, to get access to all giving them equal opportunities. And uh, I just want to highlight that the best <laughs> part of this book is on industrial policy, which is conducted by Dr. Archanan Kopaibun. And uh, Professor Kimura and I would be very much would like, I believe there are many Archanan versions in Thailand, so we we really want to have uh, many, many Archanan antique versions of, of Thailand. So we really would like to open this, this meeting to have more further collaborations with scholars from Thailand. With that, I would like to thank very much for having us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lily, for your presentation. Uh, Dr. Lily says that after the global financial crisis, the production network is still going on in the regions, uh, even though it is not uh, equally distributed uh, across the country. This is uh, her key messages that uh, he would like, she would like to highlight. Uh, but 
after I will uh, invite Achanan and then I will ask Dr. Lily for her request. He she not answer yet. How can we move up the uh, value chain, right? She highlighted that the domestic value that is not like really the thing that we should focus on. If you have uh, the low domestic value added, but we still be able to like uh, export, right? The export value is increased. We happy, right? But how we like uh, increase the value added, right? In our country, I will come back on this issue later. Now I would like to invite Dr. Ashinan Dr. to present about the uh, industry policy, right? He draw with Professor Hao Hiu. He draw the lesson from the uh, some successful case in Southeast Asian country, right? Thailand, Philippines, right? Malaysia. And then what kind of the industrial policy that government should have to be successful in the production network? Now the floor is your rationale.
basically the argument centered on the dynamic externalities, mm -hmm. learning by doing, linkages, various form of technological acquisition that will not be forthcoming if left to the market. If you're not doing the anything left to the market, this kind of good thing might not take place. That is the argument focused on. Uh, much, of the, the, much of the thinking have drawn on the experience of East Asian development, Japan and Korea in particular, which uh, the, the, they have a policy make that did not conform to the uh, free trade that much of what you call the Washington consensus. Right. So that is uh, the state of debate. They try to look at uh, this experience of East Asia and try to see what they do to have a success. In this paper, uh, we try to contribute to the, the, to the literature with the examination of the Southeast Asian experience with industrial policy. Our approach is deductive and inferential. We pick up for success case and try to examine the factor behind this growth and the role of public policy in this outcome. Right. Four of them is high automotive industry in Malaysia and the internationalization of higher education, Philippine business, uh, the, uh, business posted, outsourcing service, Cambodian garment industry. <coughs> Why? Because our country is specific. We draw, we draw out some broader generalization in the conclusion. We try to see each case and try to take the common uh, finding in this case and draw the lesson policy lesson from this success case. Definitely, we focus on success case and and uh, why it occur for the obvious reason. Success is more elusive than the failure. Right. We are interested in case where the same country have experienced both success and fail in sector promoting effort. A finding that suggests an institutional knowledge approach to understand industrial policy. Uh, is necessary. My presentation today, I will focus largely on high automotive industry for two reasons. This is my cooperative advantage of how to help you. <laughs> and second is, although the industry is often regarded as one of the most important industrial policy success in Southeast Asia, I will touch on other uh, experience like Malaysia, Cambodia, and uh, Philippines as well. <coughs> Generally, the policy setting in automotive. Automotive is often a target that by the government in developing countries to be promoted as a potential linkage, and that was one in particular, as well as a possible technology spillover. It's all captured by the value added that we talked about. We want to have a lot of value added, especially value added per unit. That's why automotive is always in the eye of the policy maker. The policy package in developing countries usually involve uh, a concept of cash saving tariff structure. You leave the tariff on the complete build up vehicle uh, very high and lower tariff one for the complete knockdown to encourage assembly activity. And then to ensure that some activity take place in that country or especially the backward one, auto part and other to impose the local content requirement. Local content requirement means you must use, use local inputs at least to, to certain extent to, to be eligible to perform this assembly productive uh, activity in that country. Right. <coughs> in some country, they go further at one. They have a national car policy, which Thailand doesn't. If you look at this, that um, uh, try to highlight that Thailand is an auto hub for ASEAN with a rapid growth, rising export oriented, and that's your big In this diagram, in this diagram, the blue line is indicate the vehicle production in Thailand. The, the orange one is vehicle production in Malaysia. In around 2000, we are more or less the same level, about half million vehicles. From then on, 
in fact, of the maximum is about 2.5 uh, in uh, 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. And right now, it's nearly 2 million vehicles. But Malaysia is still around half a million. Right? That is the different performance between Thai and Malaysia. Malaysia is the one who have a national car policy for an obvious reason. In the ASEAN, Thailand account for 51.7% of total world of production. The first runner-up is Indonesia, is 31% 30, 31 right. As Lili uh, mentioned, that is a specialization in vehicle model. We are good in pickup and passenger vehicle, multi-purpose vehicle like Innova, Avanza, or kind of uh, big, uh, including the, the Hyundai H1, also in Indonesia. Right. If you look at the snapshot of the auto industry, right, right now we are land number 12 in the world by 2016. This is only a rare case because of Thailand is only developing country, which has a very small uh, domestic market to reach that level of 12, landing 12 in the world. Right? Manufacturing vehicles in Thailand become more export oriented. The ballpark figure is half half. 100 units of vehicle produced here, half export. Another half is uh, for domestic consumption. Local content of manufactured vehicle right now increased uh, substantially over the past two decades. In some type of vehicle and one time pickup, in particular, local content is virtually 100%. Vehicle export population is now diversified. We are not concentrated only one pickup. Uh, passenger car, especially small and medium one, become more important. Uh, Yaris, Altis, this kind of Camry. Camry is uh, the, the engine about 2000 cc. That is the our uh, 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 market niche. Definitely, this is uh, all. This highlight the success case in Thailand. Definitely, like other case, we still have problem and challenge. Will be addressed later in the, in the presentation. How important the government policy in this success? Many believe that the current success is attributed by the government policy. The local, in particular, the local content requirement LCRM uh, was introduced together with the smart pickup. Uh, pick smart pickup, it means it start with, with one band pickup and then move to eco car. Many country in the world, when you travel, I say, oh, Thailand are so smart, you know, the timing, pick up is going down, pick another one. It's right now, eco car, small car, become another niche, then another, they're going to pick another one. Very soon. But in fact, there are several facts that were largely ignored so far, and so that the raw government policy to success has been overstated or misinterpret to some extent. Fact number one, local content requirement. Thailand is similar to other developing countries, have a local content requirement. But the local content requirement in Thailand are pragmatic approach. Pragmatic means we are not just top down, OK, I want this, I want that. You are the car maker, must do this and that. No. This is come from the cross consultation with both vehicle and part manufacturer. I call this a market conforming. The former involvement was to ensure that the measure was practical and acceptable. Not just out of the book. Okay, I'm going to produce engine. Tomorrow you have to have engine in Thailand. That can that is not the case for local content in Thailand. They consult with the car maker. Which one is acceptable? Which one is no, too much, right? Whereas the role of the car part supplier was to inform the government about firm existing technological capability. Can you do that? Are you able to do that? That is called pragmatic LCIM, local content requirement measure. LCIM used in Thailand between, for example, LCIM used in Thailand between 1986 to 2000 is a, a point system. A point system means each part was assigned a score. 
and you have to, to use this part up to the required score, which is 54%. The parts have been separated into compulsory one, account A, and selective one, account B. So you have to combine both of them. Interestingly, as I say, pragmatic, account A dominated by foresight non traded parts, which means when the car maker have an operation in Thailand, this part must be acquired locally. It to, it, 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 it very costly to import battery uh, or many parts of auto body. This is really bulky. You cannot just okay import some various part for the for the uh, 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 mid range of vehicle. It's too expensive. So you have to uh, have a local production anyhow. So local content requirement give a lot of score in this part. <coughs> and then, uh, this is example. And the other is, in this case, is for the account A is 20%, 20, 27 mark. 20 out of 27 is about the auto trim panel, auto body and accessory. It means it's easy to compile. It's not very elastic. Thing. So, punchline is in practice, actual local content in, in the formula was far lower than official target. So, the local content requirement measure were unlikely to have a have prohibitive adverse have impact on car maker. You are not forced them too much. You just talk with them and pick up something that doable, not just leave forking to, 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 to some. Uh, sophisticated parts. That is the first fact about the local content requirement. Second is the timing of the liberalization movement. Sometimes maybe good luck. During the, the mid 1980s, there, there, there were a major structural change in the global automotive industry. The Pittsburgh automotive market North America, Western Europe, Japan, which account for 90% of global sales, were going slowly. The growth is on emerging market economy. So car maker began to focus on this economy. At the same time, the government in number of emerging market economy began liberalizing their automotive sector through a lot of FTA at that time. NAFTA, Mercosur, for Latin America, NAFTA for North America, and NAFTA as well. At that time, NAFTA start talking about liberalization, and by the time, at the time that NAFTA was introduced, many people, many countries are not ready. That's why they have the, the, the complementary scheme, IGO, uh, 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 in place, while waiting for NAFTA to be fully effective. Thailand also undertook a policy reform to deal with a major structural change in global automotive industry. Now, uh, Thailand start liberalized at that time. While the other moved in the opposite direction, Malaysia strongly insists on, insists on having a national car policy both on Indonesia, uh, one son of the uh, President Suharto, had a discussion with the car maker about to have a national car policy. So uh, that's that's made Thailand is basically is only Facebook spot at that time if you want to put the car in that region. Right. As a consequence of this global uh, structural change, all uh, M and &E auto firm had to select regional base. One region you have, you can have one or two production base. And then that production base circulate, sell the less of sell to the less of the region. This is a diagram that 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 reflect that Thailand had been pick up first to produce a lot of uh, pick up and small passenger vehicle. Whereas Indonesia come a bit later but take the multi-purpose vehicle like Honda Free, Toyota Innova, Avanza, or Chevrolet Spins, right, and circulate through the rest 
of the uh, Southeast Asia. <coughs> right. As I said, we respond to the change where we go, we, we, we liberalize, and then we change the focus of the policy to one-time diesel engine, which uh, uh, today is a nation I might not have time to discuss, but if anyone wants to talk about, let me try on that. As well as we ship to the uh, supporting industry like uh, chemical, steel, and plastic, we are not picking up one. We try to uh, strengthen our supporting industry. Crucially and unlikely, neighboring Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand did not adopt a national car policy, right? Unlike uh, and and, uh, and Singapore show no interest in automotive. Vietnam has yet to open up its economy. So the only one that available, available for production base, for regional base, for car, for the uh, uh, multinational car maker is Thailand. In reality, national car policy was kind of about to be introduced in Thailand in the mid 1980s, but was completely killed by the civil servant from. Office of Industrial Economics. The project is last only three months because of the the minister, the Ministry of the Minister of Industry was sacked before the civil servant. So that Thailand saved from that regard. And <coughs> so and then Thailand very attractive. And then we keep doing that. We replace the import bank on CBU with the tariff and we keep our commitment on local content requirement abolishment. We remove local content requirement in 2000, even though Thailand experienced a crisis in 1997-1998. That made the policy is very clear and attractive to the car maker. The third fact that many people ignore is infrastructure development and sound and fundamental. In addition to the liberal commercial environment, two additional factors enhance Thailand attractiveness. First, we heavily invest in infrastructure in the mid 1980s, known as the Eastern Seaboard Project. Right. Uh, this simply driven from the discovery of natural gas reserve in Gulf of Siam in early 1980s, and the government want to promote petrochemical motherhood port. But from Bangkok to motherhood, we had to build something alone. And that is the origin of Eastern Seymour uh, development. Plan. And we invest. The government role is very limited, was very limited, but the carving in effect is very large. When government build the highway, other private led industrial estate jump in and trying to make use of infrastructure development. Right. And this is this south in the forcing of industrial estate along this highway. And this estate like Amata, uh, Hemarat or or Pimpong or kind of industrial estate along the way uh, provide a high quality infrastructure as such as a dedicated on site power station, efficient communication network, purification and Affluent treatment plants, abundant water resource, transport uh, infrastructure, as well as we buy, they buy, they can bypass, or many who have cumbersome work and procedure. Right. In addition, Thailand has the largest domestic market for vehicles in Asia at that time. At that time, we had the largest, especially uh, the, uh, the pickup truck. And these provide a springboard for export easily. Uh, why demand is so high, especially for the pickup truck? It's partly because of uh, the policy, trade policy toward pickup was relatively less restrictive than passenger car. The excite tax is lower, tariff is lower. So that means uh, uh, the price of pickup is lower than compared to passenger car, and that creates a lot of demand. Right. 
And let's explain why we started the pick up. Not, not, not really the government intention to, 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 to choose pick up truck, but by the side of the tariff that create the demand for pick up. And many car makers grab that. How about the eco car policy? This is the second round of pick, pick, picking up. Eco car policy act, actually, uh, again, this is a market conforming and flexible implement initiative. This is not the, actually the, the eco car project was really, uh, was, lit, was introduced in uh, about the late 1990s. During the Mr. Harry remark in his second term as a finance uh, finance minister, but the the the, the proposal has been uh, put in the under the table because the oil price at that time are very low, and it relies again during uh, 2007 when the oil price world oil price hit 70 dollars a barrel. So people said, oh, we need to have a vehicle car, and and. The government, the general body, uh, to, to learn of, uh, administration uh, undertook this initiative for where we could do a small, environmentally friendly, full, efficient vehicle, mainly several birds in one shoot kind of thing, right? But if you look inside, this is the kind of project. I'm just This is this is a the detail. The key key. The key element here is the main physical incentive under this project is lower excite tank. Lower excite tank have a very big implication for, for the final price of the vehicle in Thailand because the excite tank is on top of the tariff. Right? And, and if you import the car, tariff 80%, excite tank 30, 33% on top of 100, but on top of the tariff. Say hundred hundred dollars per car, you pay eighty percent of tariff. The price is going to be one hundred eighty, and excite tax is based on one hundred eighty. It means it's uh, very prohibitive. So when you lower the excise tax, that car thing that make the proposal become attractive. And at that time, the political economy on this policy was was quite complex. Some some car makers opposed this also because of their production portfolio was dominated by pickup, and they were not want to lose this advantage because the pickup also received a really low excise tariff. But actually, the detail that the detail about the project is come from one, one come from a car maker. Car maker one car make, car maker submit this realistic proposal about about sorry about this. The production capacity, full efficiency, euro for all kind of this thing come from a car maker proposal. One car maker want to create a niche. They develop this and submit for possible promotion to the government. The government considering it and, and take it slow until it consider such a reach. But eventually, the, when the oil price hit very high, the project gain attention and implement. So this is another, this is underlying the government pragmatic and market conforming approach here. <coughs> Four general observations from Thailand, from Thai case. Firstly, we have a consistently liberal, stable trade and commercial environment. So we don't have any, we don't have any no, uh, national car project. Actually, we rely on international car. <coughs> Policy approach has been pragmatic. Pragmatic means market conforming and consultative. And also another one is we also create a contestable market environment. We never pick only one particular firm. We always have a competition between car, car makers. Only not rely on one firm. Oh, for a time we have to have a Toyota and Nissan to compete each other to avoid any uh, monopoly. We create a contestable market environment. All decisions based on sales and make fundamental. We avoid great technological relief. Uh, economy of scale could be achievable when economy fundamental are sound. And basically, and, and the final point is sometimes we, we, 
we see that the government came in at a really good timing. Sometimes it can be interpreted as a luck aspect. Definitely, we, as other success case, we have a challenge uh, remaining. The first challenge is about the human capital constraint. When we're moving up, definitely we need to have adequate human uh, capital to go along with because when you move up the value chain, you need to have a, a more skilled worker. This is a, this is a main constraint. There are main, there, there has been many initiatives by the big company to have a cooperative with the university, but that limit to the big company only. The small, medium, and small smaller enterprise are, are yet affordable to have this kind of. Of, of, of cooperation with the university. The second is the competitiveness of the local supplier. If you uh, look at this one, this diagram shows that the important parts divided by the vertical assembly. Basically, this uh, the trend of this curve indicates how much local content requirement takes place in vertical industry. You can see the downward trend. It means one worker, one unit of worker production rely less and less imported parts. It means it increases the local content. Right? Right? As well as if you document the, the clustering in Lanchabang and Eastern Seaboard, you can see that there are so many parts around, almost all the parts where is the car maker at the center of the cluster. This is to industrial estate, uh, uh, the, the distance between these two industrial estate only uh, less than 100 kilometers, but they have their own cluster, right? And this is an uh, official figure by the uh, High Authority Industry Association. They say many high is here, high land and high majority and high 100 percent, about 60, 60, uh, 600 and 35 company. But this figure are quarterly overestimate. The actual actual figure that the the high firm really participate in this global production network and have a very good prospect, less than ten. The other produce smaller parts and uh, uh, minor parts. This raises the question if the local content requirement work well, as many people believe, we, sh we would expect a lot of indigenous suppliers participating in global production network. And actually, only less than who really capable participate in global production network. What I mean is, they really jointly decided the car maker, they can have a substantial order from this car maker. What is few, less than 10. I cannot reach I count many times uh, for the past 10 years of this firm, and that firm is less than 10. The final point is about the tech policy. Even though we export a lot, industrial protection remains very high. Tariff for the completely uh, built up worker in Thailand is about 80%. Very high. 80%. And this and the coexistence of high protection and rapid export work is explained like car maker cross subsidizing market to instruments of high of high consumer and well beyond elite after in France in Africa. For example, this is a price that I documented. We documented Toyota Camry in 2014. The FOB price in Thailand is about one million. The Retail price in Australia is 1.1 million. The difference is freight, insurance, and local tax. Which things put the car in the ship and go to Australia. This is handover by different in this price. It's really highly unlikely to, to believe that. And that's explain the cross subsidizing or oh, this is kind of international high discrimination case. Mm -hmm. okay, I think I'm finishing five.
other case, Malaysia, Malaysia is very uh, right now. It's become a uh, in the, it's become a it's become a hub of higher education. Top hundred university set up the campus in Malaysia. Offshore university like uh, uh, Monash and Nottingham. Why is success? Because basically. Uh, they, they, they have a very good fundamental, larger investment in country higher education system over the several decades since 1960. Open economy and labor market, high standard of livability, excellent physical infrastructure, livability, low level of criminal and community, and, and community living costs, a multicultural environment, uh, foreign worker in Malaysia account for nearly 30% of the total population. They widely open and widely spread English language proficiency. Uh, this is overshadow the threat from the ethnic uh, policy uh, called Bumiputra. Bumiputra, in terms of education, they have an explicit link for ethnic people can go to the higher education. That at the beginning, people, uh, uh, were, people were pessimistic about this policy. But the fundamental overshadow and pop up with the policy reform. They reform, radical reform in the private higher education and allow, allow the private university uh, establish their program. It uh, introduce a very good uh, QC program, uh, uh, accreditation and quality control that bypass all the bureaucrats and and they liberalize, they allow for a education provider to take an equity set in Malaysian Institute. And it's going to be fully liberalized in, in the near future. Uh, they install the very good quality control issue, uh, quality control system to make sure that you study Nottingham in KL campus and in the UK, they have the same quality because they're going to have a common exam high of this kind of quality control that made the uh, made the, the Malaysian very attractive and become a hub for this this uh, uh, business. Philippine outsourcing service. Uh, I, I no need to explain what Philippines is a success in this business. Just first runner up behind in the India. What explain this first uh, the policy reform again. Okay. Policy reform in the sense that uh, policy reform in the sense that during the Ramos government, President Ramos, President Ramos, they under they, they undertook the comprehensive telecommunication liberalization to bypass the 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 the, 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 the bottlenecks in this kind of infrastructure service, and it worked very well. This work on top of the global technological evolution and information and communication technology. They come together at the same time. That's why hit the boom. And the last one is because of the, the Philippines have a lot of service skill level service provision. All of this work together and make Philippines become a, a, a very useful, uh, uh, a very success in business. Uh, uh, business uh, service outsourcing. Last point I want to make is why accident? How you call this is accident? Uh, accident industrial policy. Accident is the Philippine case illustrate the, the 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 show the case that we need to careful some detail before we draw a conclusion because the business service outsourcing uh, business process outsourcing. It's kind of labor intensive, right? If business process outsourcing is success in Philippines, can be applicable to other labor intensive industries like electronic participate in global production network or tourism? Actually, no, because of, uh, there are cer uh, cer certain uh, there are certain conditions that work only business process outsourcing, but not work for the other, like you. Uh, you have, Philippines have a very high minimum wage. High minimum wage uh, is a binding constraint for low-skilled workers. But 
for the worker and the business associate outsourcing is a bit more skill. So this is not a binding constraint. And the tourism industry in Philippines has has been uh, uh, performed badly due to the poor transportation and security concern. Right? This is not applicable to business associate outsourcing aspect. Let me skip the, the Cambodian case and go to the lesson. Six lessons and six main conclusions from, from, from our analysis. Actually, all the cases involve export-oriented tools or service, highlight the importance of openness. FDI also plays an important significant role in case of high automotive car maker, multinational car maker, KME. Malaysia, Nottingham, Mona, and others set up the, the campus in, in, in Malaysia. This is the FDI, right? Second is public government policy. Most of the government policy that involve in this kind of thing is deregulation or undertake a policy before revenue, right? And third is there are some specific country factor play a role. Like in case of you know, Malaysia, the culture diversity of Philippine English language proficiency, or the people in Philippines who really accustomed to the, the culture in the U.S. because the Philippines export a lot of workers to the U.S. So they learn and they, they know the culture. So this kind of skill is very important for being a business process, outsourcing services provided. Right? Fourth, higher luck involved because of the harming. Why Thailand start liberalizing in 1988? Lady, no. Um, if you ask someone to implement this, of course, and look forward to this kind of thing. But you, leave, don't, you cannot ask this kind of question, right? But but that is kind of hard or smart move, right? And uh, definitely, openness is a necessary condition. But it needs a further consolidation before. It may also need a further consolidation before, right? And the final one is uh, you can see that within the one country they have a way, they have more success and failure. Right? In Malaysia is a very clear example. The success in international internationalization of higher education, but really fell on automotive industry. So all men that this kind of thing we have to take into account to when we consider success or failure. Yes. That for my dissertation. Thank you, Dr. Shen, for your presentation. Uh, he highlighted that it might be like a misleading for us like, to emphasize more on the government policy in uh, making us success in the automotive sector. So there are many, many like a uh, environment that can make uh, automotive uh, industries uh, success in Thailand. So why uh, he put uh, like a topic with Professor Hao Hu that policy for industrial progress, not the uh, industrial policy. Right, this is like the topic that uh, he talked. Uh, now, I would like to open for the floor to ask the questions, and then uh, both speaker can like uh, answer your questions. So, you have some questions? So, if that will have the questions, please. All right. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, Paul Vandenberg here from the faculty. Uh, I want to thank you for very interesting um, presentations on, on, on very important topics for the economies in Southeast Asia. Um, I mean, the presentations raised a lot of issues, interesting issues that we can debate. I'll, I'll try to focus a couple questions um, for both of you. I'll, I'll start with the second presentation. It's very interesting um, and a bit of a challenge to you, if you will. Um, this comparison between Malaysia and Thailand and the auto industry, you, you know, we, we hear that a lot. One's a national car project, one is not. One's been successful, one's been not. Um, to, two points. Some would argue that the comparison should be Thailand, Korea, not Thailand, Malaysia. Korea also had a very successful national car project or projects. And so, it, is the comparison right? That, that's one question. The other question is part of that. Uh, when you start to look at 
um, Korea, um, Malaysia, and Thailand is um, was was Malaysia's um, apparent failure in developing a successful car industry um, the result that it chose the path of a national car project, or was it the way they implemented the national car project? Okay, so that, that's one question. And, and that's where it becomes interesting to look at Korea. Because some people will say, you look at Korea, you look at Malaysia, you compare them to the national car projects or the efforts to develop the national car industry. Um, Korea did it right, and there were some cr critical things that Korea did right that Malaysia did wrong. Okay, especially the ensuring the competitiveness so that the, the value got up. So, so that's, um, that's generally my question. And my second question, just uh, another one, is um, you talk about you know, picking winners, and we're not always sure about it. this means firms or sectors. I wonder what you think about the, current, the government's current effort with these what they call S-curve industries, where it's picked a number of industries, sort of industry 4.0 industries, and is it, uh, is that a good policy or is, is that not a good policy to pursue it? I don't want to get you in trouble here by asking the question, but I think, <laughs> I think it's an interesting question too. Um, I, I, I think for our, our uh, Lily, the, the first presentation, which I, I think did a very good job of setting out some of the, the key issues about value change and so on. Um, to me, w one of the big interesting questions is sort of in the context of middle income trap, are we seeing are we seeing shifts um, of these networks because of sort of rising labor costs in some countries that may be shifting industries or parts of industries or tasks, if you will, to other countries? Are, are we seeing that happening? Are we seeing um, certain industries, certain parts of industries moving out of Thailand as wages rise and moving to other countries? I mean, what, what's the real is there a dynamic? Is it not only, I think the way you said it, and, and Professor Kimmler talked about the importance of value chains, but is there a dynamic? Are the value chains changing in a sense uh, because of shifting maybe comparative <coughs> advantages based on wages or what have you? Thank you. So thank you, Paul. So uh, Ashinan, could you reply, Paul, please? Okay. Uh, that would be very interesting comparison, I or Korea. Uh, I don't have any precise answer yet today about Korean car manufacturer. But if you read the broader literature in Korean economy, success of Korean economy, uh, especially the recent work by Dwight Perkin from Harvard, you can see that the picking up the winner in case of Korean is and was under the special circumstance, <laughs> under the President Park Chung hee and his determinants, surrounded with the threat from the North. When the North and South are separate, North are, we people have very high expect to the North because of their, their plenty of resources. The South, they are nothing. And the US at that time want to abandon South Korea because of the the president is not uh, was not come for the election process, right? So there's a desperation driven. So Park Chung he the president Park Chung he need to undertake something solid. That's why he tried to talk with the firm and have a very clear cut and very decisive strategy. Okay, let's pick up two firms for the steel industry. If you cannot perform within two months, two years, you terminate. That's why. I cannot remember the name of the company. Only one company is survived. This is a very special circumstance. Can it be applicable? Can we have this kind of environment in another country? I think it's very hard. Think about Thailand. We introduced a free bus a few years ago. Right now, no one can even abolish this kind of policy because of the, the, the popular and I mean, the, the popular, popularism is going right now. But, but I, I, I haven't read the, the, the in-depth the, about the Korea, but I think it related from the, the, the backward industry life still that made uh, Hyundai uh, came forward. Right. And second is about S-curve. 
if we in trouble, we can go together and discuss more. <laughs> uh, I think so. S curve is a S curve or new S curve is a dream. It's a dream. People want to have. If you policy maker, you if you want to say something fancy, especially if you are a marketing professional, you have to say something. Uh, you go to do things. No one interested. Like a middle income trap, the one who invent this one because they want to use a trap to attract attention. But if the trap, the word trap itself can misleading in to some extent. Right. Same S curve and new S curve. This is policy that they want to make the people feel confident and spending and invest. If you look at the actual implementation, there's nothing. There's nothing. And if you look at the incentive structure that they offer under the S curve, new S curve, or even Eastern Economic Corridor, ECC, they, they only want to feel different. If you be uh, targeted in the 10 S curve, new S curve, you get eight years at exemption. If you not, you get six years at exemption. This kind of minor difference would not have much impact. But for the policy maker, they need to show something on topic. That's all. Uh, before <coughs> before I answer, please kindly allow me to invite Professor Kimura. Probably want to share your insights. So if you have any difficult questions, you can give it to him. I can only take the easy ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On your questions, uh, certainly, uh, production networks are probably very dynamic. And uh, if we go back to the sort of the fragmentation theory, uh, what, what sort of uh, countries, locations can come into production networks? Two elements. One is uh, location advantages, like uh, uh, low wages, low wage labor, or availability of uh, skilled labor. Uh, the other is a sort of service being cost to connect to production blocks. So, so I think that uh, the production networks are uh, more potentials to exploit or explore as a lower wage uh, as a advantages uh, because they can be fragment tasks and production uh, processes rather than the whole, whole industry. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, subsidy cost is very important too. So, so that's why it's not really go to Africa countries, for example. So, so uh, suddenly, uh, so there's there's a potential for Cambodia and Laos to attract a certain amount of uh, uh, say production blocks, but still subsidy costs are not really good, uh, or location advantages including the uh, policy environment may not be very good enough. Uh, so, uh, and also the other force uh, not, not included in the maybe the fermentation theory is uh, agglomeration effects. So in case of uh, uh, automobiles, suddenly many parts and components are pretty heavy and uh, not easy to carry. So, and also uh, Toyota is particularly doing the just-in-time system. So they have to have parts producers nearby. So, so I think those are sort of uh, opposing effects. Uh, but uh, potentially uh, fragmentation would be, would have a lot of uh, uh, capability of uh, moving some specific uh, labor intensive uh, uh, tasks to uh, other countries. So, so in that sense, I think uh, much more dynamic than uh, all the industries. That's my opinion. If I may, one point in the case of Thailand and Korea, I think like Korea and Japan, particularly Japan, Japan used to be supplier for the U.S. car industry for 30 years before Japan developed its own auto industry. I think one of the reasons Japan and Korea are quite successful, they have a very good uh, basis of the steel. Because now, including Thai and Indonesia, they still import steel from Nippon. And Korea has quite basis good steel industry. That's why Korea is very successful in auto and ship industries. And then the second one on the labor wages, that's very true. One of the reasons that moving, like Professor Kimura mentions, one of the attractive factors is labor costs, input costs, as well as uh, services link costs, which covers logistics and, and other things. But that's only one part of attractive factors. What we find is that there are two main issues that concern most of the firms 
to make them be able to improve its value added or to make them to get into production networks. First is that labor quality matters a lot. So, I mean, we can tell probably garment industry might be affected a lot by cost of labor. But other than labor intensive industries, they're really concerned more on the labor quality. And then the second one related to labor is labor market flexibility. So they, uh, the firms wants to invest in one country, they're really looking into account all labor regulations, how much labor flexibility uh, in terms of hiring and firing workers, in terms of bringing skills from overseas, uh, in terms of those seniors on board in that kind of firms. So I think like those kind of two issues, <coughs> labor quality and labor market uh, flexibility that matters a lot in terms of production standards. Thanks. So other questions? So yes, please. Could you introduce yourself also? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Abhiram Chandrasen. Uh, I am from the Department of Trade Negotiations uh, from the Ministry of Commerce. Uh, I have, uh, first of all, thank you for the interesting uh, presentation. I have a question for Dr. Lily. Um, you have highlighted, uh, you know, certain countries that have been, uh, you know, gaining in terms of uh, manufacturing value uh, trade in the world. Especially, you have drawn attention to two uh, ASEAN countries, but these days we talk about uh, inclusive development in ASEAN. And um, I'm just wondering, what, what do you feel that uh, what other countries, especially you know CLM, well, you have highlighted Vietnam here, so probably mainly CLM. You know, what are, what can this country learn from the you know what other countries has achieved, and how can they develop you know the same kind of level of uh, you know, having values uh, added participation in the global network. Uh, that's a very interesting question, which I think I'm still learning on that because those four countries, they're still growing. But one of them, Vietnam, I can say that, uh, as everybody knows here, much better than me because we were neighbors. Vietnam is growing so fast, and then there's no doubt one of the reasons is, is openness policy. And it's really put uh, attention to improve its services link cost. Uh, I mean, compared to the other, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, uh, Vietnam has been managing very well in terms of its uh, openness, in terms of trade and uh, FTI policies. That's one of the reasons why Vietnam's exports has been growing substantially in the last uh, and other than that, I think it, it may take quite some time for so Cambodia, Laos, and particularly Myanmar. We had a lot of hope for Myanmar, but it seems it doesn't really move, progressing very well lately. Again, this is something which is beyond economics uh, knowledge, I think. Um, but in terms of economic, ASEAN economic community, it's good in the sense now they are in the loop. So they have a commitment of trade liberalization, even though we have special treatments for them in terms of trade liberalization, we allow them until 2018. And then we also have special treatment on sensitive fees for those uh, trade countries. And I'm very happy that you are here because you're part of trade negotiators, right? I, I really hope there's something going on between ASEAN and its trading partners. And that's one of the reasons that can bringing up those four countries um, to be more integrated. Probably Professor Kim would also want to add more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's a, uh, uh, the production networks are uh, a sort of combination of technology from the north to uh, a sort of neighbor in the south. So in, in, that, sense, in that sense, um, uh, late farmers have a lot of chances to come into production networks. And actually, manufacturing based production networks are generating a lot of employment for better to employ people. So, so in that sense, uh, so that, that really address uh, very strongly a sort of uh, equitable development. So I, I think this is a very important feature. So I think about the Thailand in the 1980s and 90s up to maybe 2005. Uh, so generate 
actually generates a lot of employment uh, for, for relatively poor people. People are moving from rural to suburban and also uh, informal sector to formal sector. So, so I'm quite sure about the super rich people. But uh, talking about the sort of uh, bottom in, uh, in terms of uh, sort of income level, uh, so, uh, this kind of uh, uh, industrialization generates a lot of employment. Some other questions? Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Tan from Sinaka with New York TV. Um, uh, I was very impressed with Dorothy's uh, uh, dissertation, but uh, it's kind of quite kind of possible for me to understand that one of the main points that I learned from with the, um, with the Lily's um, dissertation is that you don't have, do not have to worry much about the, uh, the ratio of the domestic value asset. But as long as the, the export values keep increasing. But then, and then the example is the case of Thailand and, and Vietnam, as you cited. But the, um, this is a presentation from Atan Atanan. We learned that the uh, local content is quite common, increasing in the automotive industry. Even in, in, in the case of, of, of Vietnam, I think we also worry too much about the decreasing uh, ratio of the domestic value added. So, um, so, so probably we should carry about both the ratio and, and, and the denominator for just one. Because in, in, in the case of Vietnam, for example, we, we are kind of failed in the automotive industry. We opened the, um, the country like for 20 years and could not create some supporting industry and backward linkage. And now we move up to the electronic uh, industry and think it is one of the targets. So I'm um, just wondering whether we should <laughs> carry both or Okay, I think that's, that's a very, very important uh, issue which is we are trying to answer in this book. Um, one thing is that increasing domestic value added, like I emphasized in the beginning, I'm not saying that I'm not advocating to reduce the ratio, but what I'm saying is, is that increasing domestic value added or domestic value added itself can be affected by the larger of numbers. First, the size of the economy. Second, is in terms of the industries that is growing. So like you're talking examples of auto industry. Auto is usually forming agglomerations. While electronics is more kind of cluster, which is very special. In terms of auto, like our channel mentions, because some of the components might be just too costly or too, too to costly to bring it into the neighborhood because the component is quite big, it's quite large, right? But in terms of electronic products, you can ship it by airplane. So that can be very specific. So that kind of electronics uh, industry might not necessarily be formed agglomerations. No, uh, so those kind of size of economy and then kind of industry that is growing that shape different kind of the trend of domestic value added, right? But the main highlight is that it's simply just numerator and denominators. What we try to advocate in this book is that if we, it's, it's fine if domestic value added over exports is growing naturally without really a pushy intervention. But what we worry is that if the mindset of the governments think that increased domestic value added over exports is important and they try to produce everything by our, by, by in domestic, that's something that worries us. Like the growing trend of anti-globalization and try to produce everything within domestic. So if, again, if increase in domestic value added is accompanied by increase in exports and it's growing naturally without pushy interventions from the governments, that's totally fine. Like Arjanin mentions, actually, what the government said in Thailand, the local content requirements is actually lower than what now domestic firms can do, right? If, if, if something happens naturally, that's fine. If the government pushed that we should produce this, of course we can. 
but there are costs that individuals have to pay, right? I'm taking examples like national car and the failure of Indonesia's national car. It used to be we try to develop national car, but it fails. Of course, Indonesia can produce it, but the WTO, but Japan and US brought us to the WTO. It was the first case in the WTO on national car. And then we failed because we didn't have enough skill, we didn't have enough good basis to develop. That's something that we try to, to we try to think that imported inputs are not necessarily bad. And we try to put forward that imported inputs, if we use it for productions, if we use it for exports, then can also be good. So the key point is that to get all producers access to inputs, to workers, so they can produce their products at the optimal cost level. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So are there questions? So if not, ask the moderator, can I ask my <laughs> So the, the questions uh, to Dr. Lily that I, 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 I left, I right, can behind that. So uh, I'm not quite sure that after the global financial crisis, I think policy makes in the Southeast Asian country and maybe around the world worry about the trade, right? And this type of thing that the trade make the country vulnerable. So do you think, okay, this kind of thing we will like have stop or try to reduce the importance of the production network in the uh, region or not? So this is a question that I would like to ask Dr. Lily and maybe uh, Professor Kula. And the second one is, uh, how can we improve, like, because that we are indigenous firm in the production network, for example, indigenous firm in Thailand. So how can this indigenous firm can receive higher value added, like uh, when you in the network? So how, how we can do that? Uh, this is the two questions. Um, the first one, I, I think uh, um, still among ASEAN countries, uh, some are really participating in and some are not completely. So, so we still have a sort of uh, uh, differences across countries and regions. But, but still, um, uh, so in that sense, still the uh, latecomers have potential to come into production networks more easily. So, uh, and, and for uh, foreigners, including uh, Thailand, uh, the subsidy cost is already pretty low, so the so firms and the industries are choo choosing uh, a, a sort of optimal balance of agglomeration and fragmentation. So, 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 so the ratio of uh, the, the part of the fragmentation may go up, may go down. Uh, I think it depends on the sort of optimal choices of uh, uh, companies. In case of China, actually, it's a, a in the past 20 years, they did a lot on some processing trade and others. In that sense, they are uh, more open than kind of optimal in a sense. So the ratio of agglomeration uh, effects will be uh, a bit larger in, 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 in the past five years or so. And it's a sort of natural choice. It's not really coming into a sort of really uh, close domestic economy, but they are open, but still uh, the companies would like to see a sort of optimal balance of agglomeration. So if you just look at the a sort of ratio of a foreign value added, uh, then, and that would be affected by many factors. So, uh, so if, if you just look at that, maybe that is reducing for some countries like China. Uh, but uh, it, it's not really, it's not necessarily uh, the, the part that based on the fact that uh, they are coming in really honestly uh, close to the economy. So, so I think that's uh, what we observe. Uh, right now, uh, so so that uh, this kind of uh, international division of labor itself stands uh, in the near future too. I think they still uh, the way of uh, doing for the international division of labor uh, is uh, still remains very important in the, in the in the coming years too. So so we have to uh, be careful that we just look at the sort of uh, export import divided by GDP or. Uh, uh, foreign value and ratios, and those are not a sort of a uh, uh, single indicator. Uh, the participation of uh, domestic players, that's definitely very, very important. Um, in case of uh, uh, ASEAN particularly, uh, still uh, the key industries like uh, 
uh, machinery in general uh, is pretty much dominated by foreign companies. Um, that itself is not bad, but I think uh, definitely the domestic uh, players should come into production later. So that they are, how far they can do that, and that's also a really big, big issue. In case of Thailand, uh, that's relatively good uh, in, uh, penetration, in terms of the penetration of uh, uh, domestic companies into uh, parts producers. Uh, uh, they, are, they are actually doing that uh, capability of doing various kinds of uh, um, uh, process innovation and uh, others themselves. But how far they can be a sort of a, a very strong players to conduct, uh, say, uh, sort of product innovation and kind of give, uh, different levels of innovation, that's, that's still a sort of question mark. So, so I think uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the era of uh, 1950s and 60s, where, when uh, Japan or Korea would embrace that, that, that was before globalization. Okay. So they, they could do various things by the uh, policies. But now, so now we are in under globalization. So, so that's why they can utilize foreign companies to speed up industrialization. That's a good aspect. But the, how far uh, domestic players can catch up with that, this is still a sort of big challenge. So I don't have a very clear answer. But, but we've got the Malaysia and Thailand globally, process innovation can be done. Uh, but beyond that, we need something else. That, that's what I, I'm thinking of. Okay. Yeah, if, if I may, I think like, it's again coming back to the basic. Uh, I see that many, many students here. So I think like it, it's again uh, to highlight the importance coming back to basic microeconomies, which is access to good quality worker, access to capital. This is something that still we need to improve. Because most of the time, uh, I don't really know in the case of Thailand, but in the case of most developing countries, if you want to start your own business, there's supposed to be a guarantee. Then how can small business have a guarantee? They are small business because they don't have any capital and assets, right? So I think, I don't know, somehow the government should think about access to capital for small and medium enterprises. Um, and the, the, the fourth one, is sorry. The third one is access to inputs. This is related to more openness. If we become more openness, and then small medium enterprises get more access to inputs from all over the world. And the last thing that I have to highlight is that some, I think you highlight a very good questions. Something that we have to work together. It's not happening yet in developing countries. Is competitions policy. So it's allow. It's it's good to have large firms to invest in our country and then let them to, to share, spill over technology and such and such. But it's also very important that we have to against monopoly and oligopoly. That's how I think to manage kind of fair competitions for small and medium enterprises to grow. So when we allow more openness when we allow more investments. But at the same time, I think it's also very important for us to enforce competitions policy as well as a firm kind of business and firm's law enforcement. So for example, it's related to wages, related to worker welfare, related to uh, social welfare for workers. There's some things that it's still kind of a big homework for developing countries to work on. But competition policy is one of the key that we have to work on together to increase the level of ability of, uh, to, to make small medium enterprises to be able to get access, of fair access to the market. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lili and uh, Professor Chibula. So do you have other questions? So if no questions, right, on behalf of the Faculty of Economic Thomas Art University, I would like to thank everyone right, very much uh, for uh, joining and participating here today for the special seminar. And the seminar team would like to make a thanks, Iria, right, for uh, this collaboration uh, for the seminar today. And we hope that we will have the uh, collaboration like this in the future right, really soon. Yeah. Yeah, so we are inviting scholars from Thailand. Okay. And then now I would like to uh, invite uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Chulothorn Gansanthi Sook.
Mokoi, right? Uh, he is a vice dean for academic affairs uh, to provide some like uh, appreciation from our faculty to Professor Kimula and Dr. Lili Thank you so much, Carl.